if you've got children who are really interested in something, you want to capitalize on that. You want to give them every opportunity there is to learn as much as they can about that thing that is deep in their soul. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Okay, I think we're we're all set up and ready to go. At least I am. Hopefully you can all hear me. Some of you joining us here for the first time, some of you back after our previous sessions. We've really had a great day. I have to say, we've done this a few times. I've had guests on webinars a few times, but today has just been so excellent. First, we started with uh, Joe Pike, my good friend, who's still on with us answering questions in the chat box. We had a very fruitful conversation about dealing with children who have special learning needs in the homeschool environment. A lot about dyslexia, dysgraphia, to review that if you didn't. Then had a lot of fun with Todd Wilson, the family man, the funny man. Talked a lot about just some of the things that make it easier or harder for homeschoolers, how to get dads more involved, how to keep family right, how to put the major on the majors, put the most important things first. And then we had a great chat just now with Lee Bintz on high school, talking a lot about college application, transcripts, credits, SAT prep, stuff like that. This fourth session is just me, don't have any guest, but I am doing probably one of the more popular talks that people have enjoyed over the years, teaching boys and other kids who would rather be making forts all day. So this is kind of a two-part talk. The first part, I'm talking about the neurophysiological differences between boys and girls, men and women, males and females, how we actually hear differently, see differently, and handle stress and pain very differently, and what are the implications of that in our teaching of both boys and girls. The second half or so is about motivation. I have been a student of motivation my entire adult life. And I've worked out some ideas kind of into a system, a, a science or art, if you will, of motivation, the four forms of relevancy, the three laws of motivation, and the two secret weapons. And then I do have some questions that were emailed in in reference to this. People had questions when they signed up. And uh, so if I can, I will address uh, some of these questions I have typed up here. And then perhaps you'll have some more in the box as we go. Years ago, I guess it's probably about 15, 16 years ago now. Boy, time flies. I met Dr. Leonard Sachs, S-A-X, Dr. Sachs. He had just written a book, Why Gender Matters. This book had hit the New York Times bestseller list. It was kind of controversial at the time. I suspect that a book published under this title today, people might make a different inference about what it means, but Dr. Sachs had done a lot of research about why it's important to acknowledge the differences between boys and girls and how they learn. He began researching this. Uh, he was working as an MD, as a pediatrician in, I believe, Maryland, New Jersey area at the time, and he noticed an increasing incidence of mothers coming into him with little boys and a note from the school that said, we believe this child has an attention deficit issue. Would you please prescribe an appropriate medication? And Dr. Sachs would evaluate the child and say, well, he looks like a pretty normal boy to me, and decline to prescribe medication. And then a few weeks later, that same mom with another note from the school would appear in the office saying, you know, we really, school really thinks he needs medication. You know, would you reconsider? What do you think we should do? And Dr. Sachs began to wonder whether people in schools 
know what most doctors know about little boys and hearing and attention. And that is that most little boys don't hear as well or as soft of sounds as most little girls. Now, I think most moms figure this out pretty darn quick. Sometimes even before they have boys, they figure it out from being married to one. But what Sachs wondered is if teachers were aware that there is a significant body of research that shows that there are measurable, concrete, and significant differences in the way that, that boys and girls hear. So he collected up some of this research and went into the public schools in his area and had conversations and engaged teachers. And he found two things very quickly. One thing he found is that no one he met in a public school had ever heard anything like this. And number two, no one that he met in the public school uh, wanted to hear anything like this. Uh, you know, the idea that there are indeed sex-based differences kind of flies in the face of what almost everyone was being taught in the schools of education, the teacher college, the teacher training programs, modern psychology. And so he realized there's, you know, a disconnect here between what people believe and what's true. And so he began kind of a project of collecting more and more information about these differences and talking to more teachers in schools. He ended up writing the book, Why Gender Matters, ended up then as a result of that consulting with schools and forming an organization, which at the time was called the Association for Single Sex Public Education. Um, which is probably not a great name for an organization, <laughs> especially these days. But what he was doing was working to educate teachers, administrators, school boards, parents, as to the benefits of segregating boys and girls. Because what he found is that if you do so, you can teach boys like boys are better taught and they learn better. And you can teach girls, as girls are often better taught and they learn better. And so he's continued this research. It's fascinating. Dr. Sachs has uh, three other books that are all very good, very important. I recommend them all. We don't sell them at IEW, but I do recommend them. The next book was called Boys Adrift, The Factors Undermining the Success of Young Men in America Today. His third book was called Girls on the Edge which is about things that endanger the success of, of girls socially, academically, intellectually, spiritually. And then the fourth book, his most recent book, has gotten a lot of traction. It's called The Collapse. Well, it is titled The Collapse of Parenting. He talks uh, about why parents today are so less willing to be an authority in their children's lives. They're trying to be friends with their children rather than guide and teach and direct, and the consequences of this on the children themselves, on schools, and of course, talk to any teacher who works in any school, especially a public school, and they'll say the, the biggest thing that keeps them from teaching is the lack of actual ability to discipline students and, and not having the parents and the administration behind them, how hard that has become. So those books are all very, very good books. One thing about Sack, you know, I don't agree with everything in his books. I would say he has a certain kind of worldview that is maybe a little different than mine. There's some kind of evolutionary stuff that creeps in. There's He's, he's not, as far as I can tell, working from a distinctly Christian agenda. I believe he's, he's a nominal Jew, cultural Jew. But the benefit of that is that he doesn't have an agenda that can be criticized as being a religious one. He's simply a very good researcher and a very astute social observer. So, you know, read read those books, but don't assume that I agree with everything in there. I would also say if you read Why Gender Matters, don't leave it lying around if you have, say, a very inquisitive 11-year-old innocent child who would just pick up any book and open it randomly and read it to see what's in it. Because there's a chapter in that book on the sexual behavior of children in America today and what kids are doing what at what ages with whom. And there's some very explicit vocabulary you might not necessarily want yet to have to define. 
if you have a, a young younger youngish child there. So just those two caveats on his book. Much of what I'm going to present to you is taken from the book. Uh, also, I had the privilege of sending in on a four-hour presentation that he gave at a Catholic schools conference in Atlanta. And I was just wrapped. I was so engaged. His presentation style was excellent. His research was was very well documented. His analyses were insightful. I was on the edge of my seat. I took a ream of notes. I was just so excited because he was presenting the research, the, the science that supports so many things that I already had experienced and knew to be true. And uh, I kind of get excited when when science supports the truth. It doesn't always happen that way, and so I, I do get excited. So let's jump in, talk about some of these things. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. If you want more, there's uh, several websites. WhyGenderMatters.com, I believe, is still up. LeonardSachs.com. He travels and speaks all over the country. He's well-respected in certain circles. He still works a lot with schools. When he began his work with schools, I believe uh, that he knew the five schools in the entire country that had segregated students by uh, boys and girls. And now I believe there are, at last count, over 700 schools that have separated boys and girls. It's legal in all 50 states to do so as long as they're getting an equal education. The results pretty much are every time it's done, it's a better environment. The students like it better, teachers like it better, test scores go up, behavior and truancy problems go down, etc. So, all right, so let's jump in though, because we're talking mostly about homeschooling and homeschool parents. If you're a teacher or a tutor or a hybrid school teacher that's with us, I'm very happy you're with us. Welcome. I love teachers, I love those who dedicate their lives to being on the front lines in schools. I've worked in both schools and with homeschools for many years. You know, let's look at these things kind of objectively and say, well, how does this fit in with my particular teaching situation? You know, most of us have a few children, and and many have just boys, just girls. Some have mixed. I personally had, I have seven children. Six are girls, and one is a boy. So I I kind of thought I was an expert until he came along and started challenging many of my thoughts. But I have taught dozens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of kids over the last 30 years. So I have a good experience there. Okay, so hearing. Evidently, the differences in hearing started at a very young age. You can look at the cochlea of newborn children, and you can actually see that the, the cochlea, which transmits the sound waves to the auditory nerve, vibrates differently at different levels of, of sound, and that uh, very young children, you know, newborns, boy, girls will hear sounds up to three times softer on the decibel scale than the boys of that same, same age. So it evidently, you know, it, it's not environmental, it's physiological. You can actually see the difference in the vibration of the cells. With children a little older, uh, SAC cites another bit of research uh, using a fMRI, a functional MRI, where you can actually take a look at brain activity that's going on in response to various stimuli. And here they found that at the one and a half to three years old age, girls were responding to sounds up to 10 times softer on the decibel scale than uh, boys of that same age. And so there evidently is, you know, just this neurophysiological difference that is well documented. Now, I must say, as Dr. Sachs points out, there are individual differences, and so there will, of course, be exceptions. These are statistical generalizations. So being generalizations, as such, they are not universally applicable because there will always be some that are Dif different than others. So there would be some boys that hear softer sounds than some girls, and some girls that don't hear as soft of sounds as some boys. So there's always going to be an overlap in the middle, but Sachs's research is pointing to the large majority, in some cases a supermajority, in the preponderance of evidence that girls hear softer sounds than boys, boys don't hear 
as soft. So this evidently, this difference in hearing does continue on into adulthood. One study people find rather amusing is uh, done with college students in Virginia. It shows that when women listen to audiobooks, they generally see neurons firing in both hemispheres of their cortex, whereas while men listen to audiobooks, they are generally using only their dominant cortex, which in right-handed people would be the left side of the brain, or you could say dominant, subdominant, right, left, but the language executive function, and not using the other uh, intuitive artistic side nearly as much as women. So we actually listen differently in adults, which causes women to realize something which they long have suspected may be true, and that is most men are, are using half their brain uh, most of the time. <laughs> at least when they're listening to them. But let's think for a moment about the implications of this for a classroom or a teaching environment. If you're a little boy and you're in a classroom and you're sitting in the back or you can't hear that teacher well or you can hear sometimes but not other times, you can hear some people but not other people, uh, you can hear on some days but not others because of the change in the barometric pressure or perhaps what they did or did not eat that morning for breakfast. There are so many things that can affect uh, the neurological function of children, sleep, diet, temperature. But let's just say you're a boy in a little classroom and you can't hear well. Well, of course you'd have an attention deficit issue, right? I mean, if I was a boy in a classroom and I couldn't hear, I would have an attention deficit problem and I would probably want to leave. But of course, you can't do that when you're stuck in a classroom. So then you have to figure out other ways to stay there and not die of boredom, but also not create trouble or draw attention to yourself lest you get in trouble. And so for me, I, I remember a lot of time in classrooms for me was about learning how to survive boredom, you know, having a holding breath competition with yourself or trying to say the alphabet backwards or seeing how far you could count by yourself or just doing any little thing you could to not be bored. I'm not, I don't know that mine was a hearing issue, but definitely if you did have a hearing issue, it would be tough. I have long noted as an adult, as a teacher of children, that if I speak loud enough to fully engage the boys sitting in front of me, the poor girl sitting next to him you know, next to them, she thinks you're yelling at them. In fact, you know, a lot of times a mom will say to a, to a dad, you know, why are you yelling at the children? And he's like, I'm not yelling, I'm talking to them. <laughs> Only, you know, it can be louder. The girls hear the, the sounds more powerfully. So we want to understand that. And if you're teaching boys, one of the first things I figured out was if you can get them together, group them up, and then, you know, I'd, I'd try to say, okay, you come over, sit with him. You sit with him over here. You go sit with her. You go sit with those girls over there. And I would just subconsciously, before I even knew this, you know, 20 years ago, before I met Dr. Sachs, I would try to get the boys on one side of the room, get the girls on the other. I would go stand over near where the boys were. And then I could, you know, shout at them, pound on the table, get right in their face. And they're like, whoa, this is so interesting. And and the girls are, you know, perfectly safe over on the other side. So think about that. You know, sometimes I think mothers learn quickly that they can they have to talk to husbands and sons more directly, uh, closer, and perhaps using a louder voice. All right, we better move on. There's so much to do. Talk a little bit about vision. One of the things that I have long suspected is that my wife and I actually see differently. That when we look at the same thing, she sees different things than I see. But now I understand exactly how that is possible and why it's true. This information was very significant for me because it has a bearing on what I do in the teaching of writing and language, although probably not in the way you would suspect. So evidently, there is a difference between males and females, mammals. So this extends beyond just humans, but male and female mammals as to how the optic nerve is connected to the retina. 
Now, you probably got enough biology or anatomy at some point in time to learn that there are two types of cells in the retina that process light information. The rods, which are larger cells, and the cones, which are smaller cells. So maybe you learned that, rods and cones. What you maybe didn't learn or maybe don't remember is that they process different types of light information. So the rods, larger cells, they process information having to do with direction and speed. So motion and direction. The cones process information having to do with color and texture. So then with two eyes, we have convergence of vision, which allows us better tracking and, of course, depth perception because we, we converge and calculate distance that way. So with convergence of vision, direction, speed, color, and texture, that's how we see pretty much everything that is visible to humans to see. So now here's what's really interesting. Most male mammals in their optic nerve, they have more M cells connected to the rods. Most female mammals have more P cells in the end of the optic nerve connected to the cones. Therefore, most males detect speed and direction with greater intensity or vibrancy or accuracy, and most females then will detect color and texture with greater vibrancy or uh, intensity or accuracy. So we actually do focus on different things. We tend to see differently. This comes out behaviorally as well. One research piece that uh, Dr. Sachs included in his uh, book was a study of newborn children and what they would focus on when they were in the crib. So they had a crib, and on one side of the crib was a, a spinning mobile with a, a spinning metallic mobile. And on the other side of the crib was a young woman with a pretty face. And then impartial observers who did not know the sex of the baby would observe the baby during waking period and record where did the baby tend to focus his or her attention. And of course, newborns don't see all that much to begin with. You know, they're, it, it's hard for them to make out things. Uh, they're just developing eyesight. Unlike hearing, they've been able to hear in the mother's tummy a, a lot more. But eyesight is, is a very new type of function. So they're going to focus on whatever is easiest for them to see. Uh, so what did they find? Well, the boys were watching the spinning metallic mobile almost all the time, and the baby girls were watching the young woman's pretty face almost all the time. And so, uh, why? Because, you know, that was what they were wired for to see more easily. Sachs also notes that you can see this uh, often coming out in children's art, in drawing that kids do. So if you go into a kindergarten, you've got, you know, kids four, five, six, sometimes even seven, eight, nine years old, and you look at what they're drawing, very often, not always, but very often, you'll see the boys trying to draw verbs, things in motion, like arrows arcing across the page, bullets coming out of a gun, explosions, whereas uh, girls tending to draw things, you know, flowers, faces, rainbows, horses, 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 a lot of horses. <laughs> And of course, the problem is, is that, you know, nouns look uh, better on paper than verbs. And Sachs says an interesting thing. He says that if you had to choose between segregating boys and girls in high school or in primary grades, that would be K-1-2, right? He says it's more important to segregate them in the primary grades because that's when learning decisions are made that can last for life. So you think about it, you know, a teacher, very well-meaning, sweet, loving teacher. She's been to early childhood. She's taken, you know, a few elementary ed, arts, methods class, maybe, whatever. Very well-meaning. She'll come over and say, oh, Billy, that's a, that's a nice drawing you've got going there. What is it? You know, and uh, Billy, you know, he's all excited. He says, well, it's a rocket ship, and it took off, and it crashed into an asteroid, and then it broke into a million pieces, and it's falling over Lake Michigan. That's because he lives in Wisconsin, of course. But he's very excited. 
of course, the, the teacher, you know, and he's used one color, probably black, you know. So the teacher would say something like, well, that's, you know, very nice, Billy. Now, next time you want to draw a rocket, uh, I have a book over here with airplanes and rockets. You're welcome to look at that. And, you know, if you used a few more colors in your picture, well, you know, they might be a little more colorful, you know. And, and, and then she goes over and says, oh, Sally, what a nice picture. You've got the house and the chimney and the flowers in the front and the smoke coming out of the chimney and the rainbow in the back and, and the front door and the horse on the lawn. Isn't that lovely? And, of course, you know, Sally used every color in the box. And it says, you know, Sack says it doesn't take very long for little Billy to figure out that the teacher likes that and doesn't like what he's got. So kids, when they feel like they have not been able to do as well as another kid, they'll actually make a decision, I'm bad at this, and then stop doing it. I don't know where or how it happened to me, and I don't blame anybody, but I do know that at a very young age, I made a very concrete determination that I was bad at art, and I should never do it. I should never draw pictures, because they're always horrible. And then, of course, you know, I went to schools, and they force you into these you know, art class kind of thing where you, they try to brainwash you that whatever you do is good and that it's fun and you never believe it and you just wait for it to be over like any other kind of purgatory. And I, to this day, I still don't believe I, I can draw anything. Probably, you know, it's not true, but I, I don't know when or how it happened, but I did make that determination at a young age. This business about vision, however, this business about vision evidently carries on into the language function because it affects the way we perceive the world we live in. Another study done with college students, uh, I, again, I believe in Virginia, was looking at the writing of creative writing of college students. So these are adults, you know, 18, 20 years old, looking at their creative writing and evaluating. There's a lot of ways you can evaluate writing. There's systems that have been set up. You can look at idea density, for example. You can identify descriptors or trends in what kind of keywords do people tend to use. And this study discovered that in men's writing, the most powerful descriptors or keywords tended to be verbs and adverbs. Whereas in women's writing, the keywords or the most powerful descriptors tended to be, guess what, nouns and adjectives. And you see this in the world, too. Uh, if you go and buy a book on how to write well, such as Writing Well by Donald Hall or Write to Learn by Zinsner or Strunk and White, Elements of Style, almost all the books on how to write well are written by men. And they almost all have this advice embedded in one or more places in the book, which is verbs. Verbs are the key to good writing. Their opinion is that kind of of Mark Twain who said, if you see an adjective in your writing, kill it. If it comes back to life, let it live. But essentially, you know, minimize the adjectives, focus on the verbs. Uh, of course, what's funny is if you go into uh, schools, right, elementary schools in particular, which are, you know, dominated by women, probably, you know, 80, 90 some percent in most schools, the teachers are women. Those women will be teaching, you know, fourth grade students. Now, children, to make your writing more colorful and interesting, you want to use adjectives, and then they'll teach all about adjectives. And uh, it's kind of funny. I've actually been challenged by public school teachers because in our system, I always teach ly adverb as the first style technique. So when you learn our dress ups in the structure and style program, the first thing I always teach is adverb. And I've had people say, well, why? Why don't you start with adjective? Adjective is grammatically simpler, which is true in a way, because the way you get an adverb is you start with an adjective, such as slow, and you put on an L-Y, and you get slowly. But, you know, I have long noted that children in general, and boys specifically, are motion-based creatures. So they can relate to the amplification of motion more easily than they can the enhancement of a descriptor on an object. Also, adverbs are easier because they can jump around inside a sentence. They're, they're more flexible. You'd almost see an attitude change in the way you talk to a boy uh, about writing. You know, if you say, hey, son, that's a pretty good story you've got going there. 
would you like me to help you add in a little more detail? Um, he may actually just say, um, no, not really, no. Uh, it's good enough, isn't it? Can I go play? But if you just change one word, you say, hey, son, that's a pretty good story you've got going there. Would you like me to help you add in more action? <laughs> he may be, all right, maybe. Okay, that's cool. Whatever. Let's do it. So uh, I do believe you can see that this comes out linguistically, and you can play to that. You can help children learn to enhance or elaborate or expand their descriptive power when you understand better the way they see the world. This is, by the way, just throw this out for what it's worth. I don't know if there's many dads with us, but this helped my marriage tremendously because I have totally blown it on a couple occasions. When we first moved to California in 99, we had got this house that needed kind of a remodel. And so my wife was busy working on the remodel details and figuring out all the colors and tiles and curtains and countertops and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm pretty much just letting her do whatever she wants because I'm just working like heck trying to pay for this thing. So anyway, one evening she, she says to me, could you help me uh, with something? Sure. Okay. And she lays out these three tiles. Right. So I'm looking at these three tiles. and She says, so which one do you like for the master bathroom? And I, I looked at these three tiles. And with absolutely no malintent nor guile, I said, well, I really don't care. And that was the straw. It broke her. She just burst into tears. You don't care. I'm trying so hard to make this a nice house for us. And you won't even tell me which kind of tiles you like. And. I didn't understand it at the time because I hadn't been enlightened on the science here. But the fact was, I just couldn't tell the difference. They were just tiles. I lived in that house almost 10 years. I still couldn't tell you what color are the tiles. In fact, it's so bad. Just last night, just yesterday, my wife says to me, do you notice anything different about the curtains in our bedroom? And I stared at those curtains, and I thought, maybe, I don't know, what's different? <laughs> and, and she goes, well, um, here's the old ones. Well, evidently, the old ones were basically white with a blue pattern, and the new ones were basically kind of a, a darkish powder blue with no pattern. And I thought, I could have stared at those curtains forever and never figured out what the old curtains looked like because I just don't register that stuff. And she understands it. So now it's kind of a joke. But I do know what to do. If she says, you know, here, what tiles do you like? Just pick something at random and say, uh, I like this one. What do you think? And then she'll say, well, I was kind of thinking this one. And you just say, oh, well. You know, that is a very nice tile, the one you picked. I, th You know, that's actually, I think I like that better. Let's go with that one you picked. You know, just feign uh, involvement. That That is the trick here, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, so vision, very different, comes out in writing. Another th area, oh, I talked about M cells and P cells. Uh, another area is stress. And I think we know that there's a lot of uh, stress involved in education, particularly in homeschooling, on both sides, on both sides. One of the things that you may have learned at some point in your education, biology, whatever, is that uh, mammals under stress have a fight or flight response. The newer science indicates that actually male mammals' uh, initial reaction to stress is the fight or flight response, but female animals under stress have almost the opposite reaction initially, and it takes a much higher threshold of stress to send a female into that fight or flight response. And it has to do then with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So a male's initial reaction to stress is increase of heart rate, increase of blood flow, increase of mobility, readiness. Uh, it's regulated by standing and or walking around, movement, jumping sometimes. A female's initial response to stress is the opposite could be called tend, befriend, uh, hide and disappear, camouflage. It's it's the parasympathetic nervous system that clicks in initially, and it has the opposite effect. It'll 
lower the heart rate, a lower blood flow. She may get nauseous. She'll want to sit down or lay or lie down. So uh, it takes a much higher threshold to send a female into the fight or flight response. This, of course, explains my children perfectly because when my children, when my son was stressed, everybody knew it. He was shouting, "Where's my knife?" He's jumping up and down. I can't find my knife. Where's my knife? I need my knife. And of course. He's just blowing off stress. The girls, when they were stressed, you had to find them. You know, they're on the couch, blanket over their head. It could be 80 degrees in the house. Are you okay in there? No. Yes. No. Leave me alone. You know, did something bad happen? Uh, I don't know. Leave me alone. Can I help you in some way? Just leave me alone. What do you do with that? I mean, honestly, I would prefer the tantrum. You can negotiate with the tantrum. What do you do with that girl? Get their mom, you know, whatever. But, you know, we may be giving the wrong, uh, we may give mixed messages to boys, right? So we say, son, sit down and do this hard math. Well, if the math is stressful, he's probably going to handle the stress better by not sitting down, by actually standing up. Maybe what we should be saying is, son, stand here at the counter or here and do your do your hard math. In fact, a lot of men these days are looking at these standing desks. And historically, men have used standing desks. Uh, and so what you may find out is that if kids are given the choice to sit or stand, they may handle the difficulty of the challenge of whatever they're trying to do better if they can be standing, moving around a whole lot more. Girls, they may need to be curled up in a beanbag or in a couch or something. So you know, let's understand that there's stress involved and that we want to allow for that. There's also differences in temperature and pain. One of these, uh, uh, Dr. Sachs claims that there's six degrees Fahrenheit, six degrees of difference uh, from optimal learning temperature, that uh, girls learn best in temperatures 73 to 74 degrees, and boys do best in temperatures 68 to 69 degrees. So, what does that mean for your learning environment? You know, it means if you got a bunch of girls and you turn up the thermostat or don't put on the air conditioning enough, they're fine, but the boys are like, oh, wake up, wake up, you know, how do I stay awake? Or if you keep it nice and cool, you know, if you're a male teacher in a school and you think, oh, fresh air, cool air is better for the brain, you keep it cool, you know, you're at 78 degrees, the boys are fine. The poor girls are like, oh, it's too cold think in here. So in the homeschool, you you may need to work at this and, you know, let the girls sit near the heater, let the boys sit near the cracked open window. Uh, you may have to make a sacrifice and turn down the air conditioning a little more than you want to if you want to get an optimal study time out of a boy. I mean, you could just say, well, 150 years ago, there was no air conditioning and everybody suffered, so we can suffer too. But you also want to, you know, understand that there are these, you know, physiological differences. So, you know, are, you may decide that you want to segregate the classroom. Lots of ways that Dr. Sachs talks about implementing these changes, mostly in an institutional setting. But I think you can extrapolate from this some of your own ideas. I want to move on, though, and, and talk about motivation. And that is because uh, we are going to run out of time here and I do have a few questions. But one thing I have discovered is that when you're teaching and students are learning, if something is applicable, meaningful, interesting, relevant in some way, it's easier to learn. Wouldn't you agree? If something is less interesting, less meaningful, less applicable, less relevant, it's harder to learn. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, that's true for everybody, not just kids. And so this kind of intangible quality that I have identified here, I have chosen to call relevancy. So if something is relevant, it's easier to learn. If it's less relevant, it's harder to learn. If it's irrelevant, it's very hard to learn. W wouldn't you agree? So let's look at the forms of relevancy. The first form of relevancy I have labeled intrinsic relevancy, meaning it's just part of you. It's just who you are, right? It's just embedded in your soul, your DNA. It's 
it's just there. And, and we all have some of these. Sometimes they are general. For example, um, I will ask audiences, um, how many of you in this room, there could be you know 20, there could be 2,000 people in the room, how many of you have met a boy between the ages of, say, 9 and 12 who is not interested in knives, swords, or weaponry of some sort? And I tell you, we're in the high 99%. I think maybe I meet two people out of a thousand who will say, yeah, I've got a 10-year-old, couldn't care less. But honestly, I, I think we're in the high 99%. Boys are just intrinsically attracted to weapons. Why? And tools. Why? Well, it's just part of who they are. You know, another example, though, could be very specific. My mother says, uh, said, she's passed on now, but she did say, to me that I was begging for a violin from the time I could talk. And why that's interesting is because I I did start playing the violin at a very young age, um, just under five years old, and I continued throughout my childhood. And, and then I ended up becoming a violin teacher. And, and now I can guarantee you, you know, I would not be here, you would not be here, nothing about my life would be what it is. The Institutes for Excellence in Writing would not exist I'm absolutely sure of it, if I hadn't grown up playing the violin. It completely affected my destiny in every way. And so for, you know, for various reasons, I always encourage parents to look for those intrinsic relevancies. If you've got children who are really interested in something, you want to capitalize on that. You want to give them every opportunity there is to learn as much as they can about that thing that is deep in their soul, deep in their heart. Why? Because that's where the learning is going to be, you know, very strong, very profound. By the way, the, these three children in this picture are three of my grandchildren. Uh, the picture's a few years old, but they're every bit as beautiful and cute and charming as they are now. And they actually are, are so much older, they have two younger siblings, if you can believe it. Um, love them so much. So intrinsic relevancies, you want to capitalize on those. The second form of relevancy would be inspired relevancy. This is an environmental factor. One of the things that I learned about, a huge amount about um, as a young person is sailing. I know how to race boats. I know how to navigate boats. I know the vocabulary, the vernacular. I know so much about sailboats. I have no interest in sailboats right now. My desire to sail is is about one one on a scale of one to a hundred, but I know it. Why? Because I grew up because my father loved sailing. So uh, I just wanted to be with him. I wanted to sail boats with him. I wanted to race with him. I wanted to impress him with my great knowledge of sailing everything. And so I read and I looked at the magazines and I researched and I paid attention. And so I became, you know, an expert in something. Uh, because I was inspired by him. I think we all can look back to our childhood, even our education. If you think about you know, when you were in school, what were the subjects that you liked, that you wanted to learn, that you even studied maybe a little bit more outside the required amount? Almost always those subjects are connected with exceptional teachers, teachers who loved what they were teaching. And my worst subjects, I think, were the ones whose the teachers just seemed terribly dull and uninterested and uninteresting and were just doing time. So I think that what we we want to, as homeschooling parents, we want to, and teachers, is, is work hard to inspire our children with those things that we love and appreciate and know about. And we can teach those better and maybe avoid teaching things that we don't love as much and maybe find other people to teach things that that you don't love that they do. So we've never been a homeschool family that's big into, you know, large organized co-ops or whatnot. But I've always tried to broker deals on a small scale. So I usually, you know, get together and say, oh, guess what? You know, you're a nurse. And, and so maybe we could do this. You send your kids over to my house for a few hours a week and we'll do Shakespeare and writing and speech, public speaking. And then I'll send my teenagers over to your house for a few hours a week, and you can uh, teach them uh, biology and chemistry because you love that stuff. And I really have 
no interest whatsoever in anything resembling biology, chemistry, or physics. Unless it pertains very directly to what I do. And usually, you know, it's a good deal. They're happy to have someone who loves language and literature uh, teach it, and I'm happy to have someone who loves science teaching it, because then my children have the best opportunity to be inspired. The third form of relevancy is when there's really, you know, things that aren't interesting to anybody, but you still have to learn them. I suppose things, you know, that are kind of tedious, kind of mechanical, you have to learn them by road, or you have to, things maybe like multiplication tables, English spelling and grammar, maybe some basic geography. What you know, there's always things we have to learn that that aren't terribly interesting. So in this case, you can create a game. Uh, this would be contriving relevancy. Uh, this can be very effective. In fact, if you watch uh, any of these uh, teacher hero movies, there's a whole bunch, maybe you know, half a dozen or more movies in the last couple decades about hero teachers, the the ones who went in and made a big difference. Very often, there will be some scene in the movie showing them uh, how they're engaging students with a game. And so I've been a big fan of games. Uh, and I've observed a, a few things about games. Uh, number one, you have to have a game so that it's possible for someone playing the game to win. They have to be able to win. It has to be possible. Uh, the entire gambling industry is based on this idea that it is possible to win. So. Uh, if it weren't, well, who would ever go to a casino except really, really stupid people? But if if it, if you play your cards right, it's possible to win. If you leave as soon as you win, you can come out ahead. You probably won't because you'll stay there too long and lose it all. Anyway, but because it's possible, people will play. So same thing with kids. Uh, if If a child feels like it's possible to win, he'll play your game. And if not, he'll just walk away. I watched my wife kind of you know, blow it one day. She had her two youngest, a uh, very dyslexic nine-year-old son and six-year-old daughter, and she had made this game with little flashcards of the Dolch words, you know, the Dolch reading list, the ones that don't work, that don't work very well phonetically. You can't really sound them out. Words like wood, W-O-U-L-D. I mean, where did that come from? Wood! You know, we got some kind of crazy Anglo-Saxon derivative or whatever. Anyway, so you can't really sound those out. You just got to know them. They're the sight words, right? So she had this little game, and she had 100 sight words, and, and the game was if you, can, if you can identify the word in three seconds, you get to keep the card. And if you don't, then the other person gets the chance, and whoever gets the most cards wins. Okay. Well, she'd been at it for about three minutes. The score was four or five to zero. Who's ahead? Yeah, six-year-old daughter. Um, what does the nine-year-old dyslexic son do? Stand up and walk away. What's the mother to do? Son, you get back here and lose this game right now. <laughs> so you have to construct the game so they win. So I coached her. I said, okay, you got 100 words. First of all, give him as much time as he needs. Second of all, cheat if you have to. Mouth the words if you have to. Do whatever you have to to help him identify these words. And then whoever gets you know 40 words wins the game. And you got 100, so... You know, both people can win. There's no rule that says someone has to lose, right? So that's one rule of games. The other rule of games is is if you're going to use any kind of economic system as a game, there has to be both a potential gain and a potential loss. Uh, an example of how you might set this up, uh, let's say you've got a child wrote a story, wrote a report, paper, whatever, and there's a bunch of misspelled words. And you read it, and you're like, oh, this kid really could spell these words right if he'd just try harder. Okay, fine. There's a lot of ways to handle that. One would be, say, uh, you've spelled you know, all these words wrong, go fix them up, and you know, suffer confinement until you succeed in doing that. Um, another way would be to just fix them up, hand it back, say, copy it over. Uh, if you want to make it into a game, you do it like this. Count them up, and let's say you find 10 words that you believe this child should be able to spell. Now, maybe there's you know, a few they shouldn't. You fix those. But you say, I think there's 10 words you could spell. So here's the deal. Find and fix all 10, you win a dollar. Find and fix 9, you still win 50 cents. Find and fix 8, you win a quarter. Find and fix 7, you win a dime. Find and fix 6, you win a nickel. Find and fix only 5, it's a break-even deal. Find and fix only 4, you owe me a dime. Find and fix only 3, you owe me a quarter. Find and fix only 2, you owe me 50 cents. If you can't find any or only one, then you owe me a dollar because I'm going to have to do all your work 
for you, and I'm not going to do that without getting paid. Oh, this completely changes the entire scenario for this kid, because this is no longer a chore to be procrastinated, argued, ordered. This is a game called Get Mom's Dollar, right? And uh, there's kids who will sit there for two hours, you know, with the dictionary, a spell checker, typing all the words in on a computer to see it, you know, and figure it out. Because what do they want? They want the dollar. And it doesn't matter whether you use, you know, dollars or points or whatever. But I would say boys in particular really appreciate economic systems. They're just wired for it. I, I think that's a good thing. You know, some people say, well, you know, you're bribing a child to do what they should do anyway. No, honestly, you're not. Bribing is when you pay someone to do something which is illegal or immoral, right? When you acknowledge the the lawful, licit, honorable efforts of a child, um, that's called getting paid. And, you know, I love my work. I love traveling around. I love doing conferences. I love everything I do. But I probably wouldn't do everything I do if I weren't getting paid for it. In fact, I'm pretty sure... My wife would not let me travel all over the place if I weren't getting paid for it. Um, so, you know, uh, the desire for compensation for efforts is it, just intrinsic, a human thing. And I think boys are particularly wired toward these economic systems. Why? Because, you know, they need to grow up, I hope, with the idea, I want to support my family. I, I want to contribute meaningfully. I want to do work. But I expect to be compensated. If that's part of being a man, that's probably also part of being a boy. So, you know, look at how you can use some uh, contrived relevancies to help uh, children uh, focus in and get the repetition and learn things that may not come so easily because they're not intrinsically interesting or uh, or inspired. Uh, the last form of relevancy would be enforced, and that's essentially where you say, "Kid." you must learn this or you will suffer a penalty, right? So you're, you're just enforcing it. And, you know, you can do that. You can say you have to, you have to learn this or suffer. And, and what you often get there is you get the appearance of learning, but you don't get the real engagement that comes. Because, you know, one thing is, you know, students learn best when they choose to. Right? Learning happens when learners choose to learn. Students learn when they choose to study, and it sticks with them. But unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of my experience, I don't know about yours, but the whole reason you did stuff was because it was enforced, right? So take, for example, my, my most despised high school class, biology. I took biology. I've got a grade on my transcript to prove it. I think it was an A, too, but I never learned any biology. But the mentality was this. You have to take biology because if you don't take biology, you won't get a grade on your transcript. In fact, if you don't get a, a good grade in biology, you won't get a good grade on your transcript. And if you don't get good grades on your transcript, that will bring down your GPA. And if your GPA is too low, you won't get into a good college. In fact, if your GPA is too low, you might not get into college at all, which means you're simply going to suffer a life of poverty and misery and suffering. And that's why you should study biology, right? I mean, how many of you kind of experienced that in some course or at some point? You know, you do it because you have to. But how much real biology did you learn? I mean, two months after the class was over, what percentage of that textbook or those lectures or whatever, you know, what percentage do you retain? 10% if you're a genius, 5%, 2% if you're like me, I, you know. Any biology I actually know, I learned probably later in life because there was relevance, because it applied to what I was interested in, which was, you know, child brain development or education or the physics of music or whatever. Okay, so there's your relevancies. Let's move on. I'm running a little bit over time, but uh, I think we can take a few more minutes and finish up the three laws of motivation. The first law is this. Children like to do what they can do. Actually, this is true for all of us, isn't it? Don't we like doing what we're good at? If you're good at, you know, if you're good at sewing, if you can sew, you like sewing. You know, I don't like sewing. I'm not good at it. I can't do it. Um, if you like cooking, you're good at cooking. 
uh, you want to cook, you like cooking. This is the first thing out of children's mouths as soon as they can talk. They'll say, Grandpa, look at me. Look at what I can do. Look at me flop on the couch. Look at me leap across the room. Look, I can do a somersault. Look, I can stand on one foot. Look, I can wink one eye. Right? Children want to show what they can do. And the great thing about young children is they're constantly able to do more than they could yesterday. So they're always getting better. So there's a joy. I mean, you know, imagine what it would be like if every day you got stronger and smarter and more coordinated and better looking and more literate and more, you know, better vocabulary. I mean, you'd be in a state of constant happiness, wouldn't you? And uh, this, by the way, is my grandson, Aiden. Uh, he's one of the grandchildren that lives with me, near me, here in Oklahoma. He's now five years old, so this picture is dated. And he's got a younger sister, Chaley, who's two, and they have a newborn sister who is five, six days old named uh, Sienna, Sienna Claire. So, But, you know, Aiden's always like that. Every time I see him, he's like, look, Grandpa, look, look at me, look at me. Okay, so we're all like that. We like to do what they, what we think we can do. Um, now, the next law is that children want to do what they think they can do, right? My son, when he was about 10 years old, for example, wanted to jump off the roof. Why? Why did he want to jump off the roof? Because he thought he could. I had no desire whatsoever to jump off the roof at 40 years old. I did not want to because I did not really think I could do it without getting hurt. Now, at 58, I'm absolutely certain that I don't want to jump off the roof. But children want to do what they think they can do. And so we want to give them that opportunity and then help them be successful. What happened with my son, obviously, is he did jump off the roof and he was successful. Consequently, he did it again and again and again. And it moves from want to into like to, right? So if children want to try something, they are successful a few times. Now they like that thing, and so they they will do it more. So that's what we were looking for is mastery. So they do it again and again and again until it becomes easy, and then they like it. Kids who like math like math because they can do it successfully. Kids who don't like math don't like math because they don't believe they're successful. They have somehow fallen into this third category, and, and that is children hate to do what they think they cannot do. This is really true for all of us. I, for example, absolutely flat out refuse ever again under any circumstances to get on a snowboard. I will not do it. I will not go snowboarding. Why? Because the last time I tried it, which was 15 years ago, was so awful, so miserable, so frustrating, so embarrassing, so painful, so entirely like every bad adjective you can think of from Alexander's ho terrible, no good, awful, horrible, miserable, rotten day. That was my experience snowboarding. And so I just said, no, I'm never going to do it again. And you can't even pay me enough to do it. I mean, it would take a five-digit number tax-free to get me on a snowboard for a whole day again. Now, my kids, they didn't understand this. Like, Dad, you should come with us. It's fun. You know, if you just practice a little bit, just get the hang of it. You know, you, it's fun if you – we know you could do it if you would just try. We know you could do it if you would just try. But how many times have we been on the opposite side of that? My attitude for them is, no, absolutely not. You go to the snow with your mother and go ski, snowbird, whatever you want, and I'll go fly somewhere so I can pay for your stupid trip. That's what I'll do. I'm not going. But how many times have we been, I mean, if you have ever caught yourself that saying to that to your child, I know you could do this if you would just try. There is nothing more useless you could say to motivate a child because if they don't believe they can do it, there's nothing you can say that's ever going to cause them to think so. In fact, here's a sad but true point, and that is this. Children would prefer punish, in many cases, children will prefer punishment over failure. If they believe that they cannot do something successfully, they will refuse to do that and just suffer the consequences rather than do it and feel like they failed one more time.
Now, fortunately, children are more resilient than most adults. You know, one bad snowboarding trip, I'm done for life. Kids can fail, you know, two, three, four, ten times. I mean, everybody has a different threshold of failure, but everyone does have a threshold at which point they will say, no, I will not do that because I will fail and it will be awful. And they'll prefer punishment over failure. So if you want to apply these three laws, then what you would do is say, okay, we're trying to learn something, trying to do something, trying to accomplish something. Um, you know, spend 60 to 80% of your time letting them do what they can do and get better at that. And then 20 to 40% of your time letting them do what they think they can do and helping them be successful, whether it's writing or math or Latin or snowboarding, whatever. You know, piano, music. Uh, I was a violin teacher for 20 years. So you help them be successful. And if and 0% and of your time asking them to do what they think they cannot do, you would have a 100% of the time totally motivated human being. Now, I will be the first to say that is easier said. <laughs> easier said than done. But that's the basic principle. And if you have a child who hates something, Nine out of ten times, it's because they don't believe they can be successful. And so they're saying, I hate this because I can't do it. And you just back up and you go to a simpler level of complexity where they did have success, whether it's, like I said, math or writing or Latin or anything, right? Help them be successful. And then when that's easy, and only when that's easy, go to the next step of complexity, help them be successful. And when that's easy, and only when that's easy, go to the next step and help them be successful. And at a certain point, they'll say, hey, I have a momentum of success here. I think I don't need your help anymore. Okay, mom, leave me alone. I'm going to try this on my own. And now you have a properly motivated student. All right, I want to share with you two secret weapons very quickly, and then we'll answer a couple questions, wrap it up here in a few minutes. The first, uh, th these are really one secret weapon. It's just two sides of a coin. It's just two very similar things, but a, a, a technical idea. The first one is the economic principle, uh, emotion principle. Many of you have heard of this idea of the, uh, the emotional gas tank or the emotional bank account. Um, I like the bank account better than the gas tank implies that you fill it up specifically so that you can drain it out. Whereas a bank account, it's nice to just keep your money in there. Uh, and so I learned this uh, probably first time I really heard it was from my teacher, Dr. Suzuki. I was living in Japan studying with uh, the great Shinichi Suzuki. I lived there three years. And he talked about this. He said, you have to build up. You have to deposit into the child love. Uh, and you have to deposit enough love that you can live off the interest. You build up enough positive so that when you have to make a withdrawal by making a correction, you can live off the interest that you have of a principal. And when I was in Japan, you could live off interest because it was the Carter years and it, interest was 11% or something. Now what it is, one, one tenth of one half of 1%. But So when I came back from Japan, I actually um, thought about this and I thought, okay, I'm going to, in every interaction with my violin students, I'm going to say 10 positive things before I make the first correction. See, one of the problems with teaching violin is that as soon as someone picks up a violin, they're doing everything wrong. I mean, teaching violin is just constant correction. And I don't know about you, but I don't like constant correction. I don't know anyone who loves to be corrected constantly. Therefore, you have to balance it all out. So, hey, you're on time. Thanks so much for being on time. Hey, that's a cute blouse you got on. I don't know if it's a blouse. I don't know what a blouse is. It's a shirt. I don't know if it's cute. I, I don't know girls' clothes. I don't even know what color it is, honestly. But I do know one thing. That 12-year-old girl spent 30 minutes trying to figure out what to wear. Or maybe even lost sleep over choosing the next day's wardrobe. <laughs> so I'm just acknowledging, okay, she, her choice. Hey, your violin's nice and clean. It's a good thing you keep it clean. It's good to keep your violin you know, cleaned off, polished up. I don't know if she cleaned it. Maybe her mom cleaned it. Maybe she didn't touch it for a week. That's possible too. But it is clean. So I'm not talking false praise. I'm just saying 
you find positives. And that way, your, your sincere comments um, build up the emotional principle, it should be P-A-L in your bank, the amount of, of principle you have, and then you can live off the interest. The other thing I discovered is the power uh, of a smile. Um, I used to practice smiling secretly. I'd go to a mirror and try out all different kinds of smiles. <laughs> and then go try them out on kids. But I want to finish up with just a little story about my daughter Fiona. Um, when Fiona was eight, a young eight, uh, we were very, very close. She was probably the most daddy's girl of all the girls. I was in the Spokane airport with my family. They were dropping me off. We were living in Idaho at the time. And I was going to fly to Boise and be gone for six days. And little Fiona just lost it. She just burst out and said, Oh, Daddy, do you really have to go? I miss you so much when you're gone. I, I thought, yeah, I'm sorry, Fiona. This is what I do. I, I have a commitment. This is how I support our family. I thought, wait a minute, Spokane to Boise. This is a short, cheap flight. I made a quick phone call. I said, Fiona, you want to come with me? And she said, really? I said, yeah. We'll just buy a ticket right here at the counter. And you can just get on the plane with me and fly to Boise and be with me for six days. And you can be in my writing class, and there's a family you can hang out with and play with their kids. I checked it out, and you just come with me. Of course, Mom's kind of like, ooh. And, and, you know, I said, sweetheart, I'm not totally incompetent here. We'll go to Walmart, we'll buy some underwear and a toothbrush. Okay, this is going to be fine. All right, so I took her with me, and I let her sit in my writing class. And it was a two-hour two and 45-minute class that I used to do uh, on Monday. I was doing Monday through through Thursday. And uh, she was definitely the youngest child in the room. I, I don't even know what she did. She didn't do much in the way of reading or writing at that age. Uh, maybe she copied half the keyword outline. I don't know. Maybe she wrote a sentence. I was too busy to notice what she was doing because I was running around helping all the other people's children whose parents had paid for me to help them. Uh, so after the class was over, I sent her off with the family and then I came, I taught two more classes. I went to pick her up about six o'clock and uh, we're driving back to the hotel. And I said, so Fiona, how'd you like the writing class this morning? And she said to me, oh, daddy, it was, it was just wonderful. Just like that. And I thought, oh, I'm good, you know. And then she said something changed my life. She said, daddy, how come you're not like that at home? And I realized how easy it is for me to be unconditionally supportive, unconditionally enthusiastic, unconditionally excited, unconditionally appreciative of the efforts of other people's children, and how easy it is to forget to be that way. You know, it's because like, yeah, you love me, I love you. We know this. So would you get to work, please? Quit fooling around. We got stuff to do. So that changed my life when she said that. How come you're not like that at home? I realized I had a long ways to go to be the very best teacher of my own children that I knew that I could be and to move to that unconditional key. You know, the, the key to really great teaching is being unconditionally loving and appreciative and supportive and grateful and acknowledging the efforts of our children even though we see them every day and it's so easy to, to lose that. So anyway, so that's my little story and uh, that's uh, the talk we got through basically on time. I'm, I'm a little bit older. Uh, there are a couple questions here. Terry, Terrell has a, a very good question. What, what do you do when students say they're bored? This is boring. That is a circumstance where they're saying, this is just not challenging enough. I've done this a lot of times. You know they need more repetition, but they don't believe it. And so what I would do at that point is try to make it more into a game. Try to use some contrived relevancy and say, OK, well, if this is so easy for you, then let's see if you can do it. 
in you know a certain number of seconds or minutes uh, make a special challenge uh, let's see if you can do it perfectly you know and and go to that scale and if you get it absolutely perfect you get 10 points if you miss one thing you get nine you if you miss 10 things you get zero we'll put it on your grammar chart here and once you've got you know 2,000 points you get to go to the ball game with dad or we'll go buy a new you know paintball gun or something like that so you can set up an economic system and then they really still don't care about whatever they're doing grammar or vocabulary because to them it's boring but what isn't boring is getting points and working toward uh, a reward for that prize so you know I would say that um, I also know that I've had a lot of people tell me the grammar thing they were doing was boring but the fix it that we have is different um, and there are a few things that make it different one is it is kind of like a game because you are trying to find everything and see if you can catch every all the things and there's not a test and you know you don't get scored it's just a game and then it tells a story so that involves the students in the narrative so I don't know Terrell if you haven't tried our fix it grammar you might you might like that but I think the trick is is if they're boring they're essentially saying this is not challenging enough for me and my own belief system therefore um, your job then would be contrive a little bit greater challenge that would be my my way to suggest it um, Catherine I don't really have a talk on intrinsic relevancy but uh, I do have some podcasts uh, I don't know the link directly but I I believe I did a series of three podcasts all on just on motivation and so there would be a lot more content there perhaps in the future what I should do is is look at just those forms of relevancy and do a whole you know 20 minutes or so on each of them because there is a lot to say but I will think that you will hopefully think about this and notice things a little bit different Kimberly does tinnitus have an effect on hearing and learning I, do, I don't have any experience but I would assume yes because tinnitus uh, would have a profoundly detrimental effect on me functioning at all and if there's a way to treat it I know there's people who claim this treatment or nutritional or, or something else uh, of it is of its own Elizabeth is asking a very technical question is fix it a complete grammar program on its own that would depend on how you define complete I would say if you do fix it and you study Latin then you absolutely have a complete uh, grammar program the best way to learn analytical English grammar is to study Latin or at least some other foreign language and then in terms of uh, applied grammar yeah I think fix it is you know the best thing out there we won the practical homeschooling first place award 2018 with our fix it grammar and I was almost surprised at that uh, to see it hanging on the wall hey great we won so it does work okay so uh, I think that's about where we will finish up with this one and uh, so those are our, some of the additional resources we have for you if you're not familiar with them all for our final session of the day thank you everyone so much for joining us for this talk I hope it's been helpful and useful for you and of course uh, the recordings will all be made available to those who signed up in advance for the webinar so God bless you and We'll hope to see you around on, on the convention circuit if you are at a convention or virtually if not. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudoua and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.